when it comes to the world's most dangerous sports, look no further than deep shipwreck diving. Few other endeavors exist in which nature, biology, equipment, and instinct conspire to so completely attack a person's mind and disassemble one's spirit. Many dead divers have been found inside shipwrecks with more than enough air remaining to have made it to the surface. It is not that they chose to die, but rather that they could no longer figure out how to live. In the fall of 1991, two recreational divers discovered a Nazi U-boat off the New Jersey coast. The 56-man crew still aboard. No government, historian, or navy had a clue as to which submarine it was, who the sailors were, or why it was in New Jersey. Many mysterious ships, whose fate we do not know, rest at the bottom of the ocean. This is the story of one such wreck, dating back to World War II, and the journey of how it came to be identified. Between 1939 and 1945, Germany assembled a force of over 1,100 U-boats, each one for its ability to stalk enemies invisibly became the most terrible reflection of one's first fear, that death lurks silently. In early 1942, Operation Drumbeat was launched. A surprise attack on American ships off the East Coast. In the attack, Nazi U-boats pushed up against American shores so closely that crewmen could smell the forest from their decks, watch automobile headlights through their periscopes, and tune in to American radio stations playing jazz music. The first weeks of Drumbeat were a slaughter as U-boats torpedoed unprotected ships. Five months later, a handful of U-boats sunk nearly 600 ships in American waters at a cost of just six of their own. The worst defeat ever suffered by the U.S. Navy. Winston Churchill wrote, The only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. It was no longer safe to be Goliath in a world where David could turn invisible. The Americans, however, did not remain vulnerable for long. The greatest Allied breakthrough came in the form of code breaking. Since the beginning of World War II, the German military had encrypted its communication through a cipher machine known as Enigma. The typewriter-like device was capable of millions of character combinations and was believed by the German high command to be invincible, the strongest code ever created. Allied codebreakers estimated the odds against a person cracking Enigma without knowing the code to be 159 quintillion to one. They tried anyway. Building on years of pioneering works and with the help of a captured Enigma machine, Teams of cryptographers, mathematicians, scientists, 
crossword puzzle experts, linguists, and chess champions spent months attacking Enigma, even building the world's first programmable computer to aid in the effort. Months later, with the help of covert intelligence, they cracked it, which today is regarded as one of the greatest intellectual achievements of the 20th century. Commander-in-Chief of the U-Boat Force, Carl Dunitz, suspected that Enigma could be compromised, but was constantly assured by experts that the code was unbreakable. The Allies continued to read the German mail, U-Boats continued to die. The fangs of Allied technology had encircled the U-Boats, leaving no safe areas in the ocean. In May of 1943, 41 U-boats were destroyed by Allied forces, a disaster that came to be known as Black May. The hunters of the early war had now become the hunted. Because most U-boats died beneath the water's surface, as many as 65 disappeared without explanation. In worlds of unsearchable water, U-boats made the perfect, unfindable graves. Until those who searched found. Deep shipwreck diving bears only a passing resemblance to its cousin, the resort area single tank scuba that is familiar to the general public. Out of the world's estimated 20 million certified scuba divers, deep wreck divers make up only a few hundred. A deep shipwreck diver confronts two primary dangers. First, at depths greater than 66 feet, judgment and motor skills can become impaired, a condition known as nitrogen narcosis. As one descends further, the effects of narcosis become more pronounced. Beyond 100 feet, where some of the best shipwrecks lie, one can become significantly handicapped. As a diver breathes underwater, the extra nitrogen molecules being taken into the lungs don't just sit around as they do in a person on land. Instead, they dissolve into the bloodstream and travel into one's tissues, such as the joints, brain, and spine. The longer and deeper a diver stays underwater, the more nitrogen accumulates in those tissues. Some have compared the effects of narcosis to alcohol intoxication, others to the twilight of a waking anesthetic. At 130 feet, most divers will be impaired. Some struggle to complete simple tasks such as tying a knot. As a diver descends even deeper to 180 feet, they may start to hallucinate. Many experience the jungle drums, the deafening sound of one's own pulse. Below 200 feet, narcosis can supercharge the normal processing of emotions. Tiny problems can be perceived as unfolding catastrophes and snowball into complete panic. If narcosis weren't bad enough, the second danger for a deep shipwreck diver lies in the fact that if should something go wrong, they cannot swim to the surface. Divers who have spent time in deep water must ascend gradually, stopping at predetermined intervals to allow their body to readjust to decreasing pressures. They must do this even if they believe they are suffocating or dying. Panic divers who bolt for sunshine and seagulls risk a case of decompression sickness of the bends. Severe bends can permanently handicap, paralyze, or kill a person. When a diver ascends quickly, the surrounding atmospheric pressure drops rapidly, which causes the accumulated nitrogen in their tissues to form quantities of large bubbles, just as when you rapidly unscrew a soda bottle cap. Large nitrogen bubbles are the mortal enemy of the deep diver. 
a diver breathing air who spends 25 minutes at a depth of 200 feet might spend an hour working their way back to the surface. An excellent diver boards the boat with a plan. For days, maybe weeks before the trip, they study the deck plans, memorize its contours, and set reasonable goals. In recreational scuba, the buddy system is gospel. Divers stay in pairs, poised to help each other. On the bottom of the Atlantic, however, a well-meaning diver can kill themselves and their partner. In 1988, a skilled Connecticut diver named Joe Drozd signed up for a trip to the Andrea Doria, the Mount Everest of shipwrecks. The Grand Italian passenger liner had collided with the Stockholm, a Swedish liner in dense fog off Nantucket Island in 1956. 51 people died before the liner sank and settled on her side at a depth of 250 feet. The Doria made siren calls to wreck divers since the day after her sinking. The wreck was so deep and dangerous that decades after her sinking, entire decks remained unexplored. When Joe Drozd made his first journey to the Great Wreck, one of his valve regulators on his back became tangled. What would normally be a simple maneuver quickly turned into a terrifying result. Starved for breath and believing his primary tank to be emptied, Draws spiraled into full terror. Draws spat his regulator from his mouth. Icy salt water choked his lungs. His gag reflexes fired. His remaining partner offered Draws his backup regulator, but Draws, knife still in hand, slashed wildly at the man. His mind sprang in a million directions. And then Draws turned and swam down the wreck, still slashing, cutting the ocean to shreds. And he kept swimming until he disappeared into the blackness of the wreck, and he never came out. One day in 1991, a New Jersey fisherman loses his net, snagged by something on the bottom. A group of deep shipwreck divers go down to see what's there. In the wreck, one of the divers spots two bowls of china. Engraved in black is the year 1942. Above the marking, the eagle and swastika, the symbol of Hitler's Third Reich. What began as a fisherman's accident now starts these divers on an exploration of World War II. A mere 60 miles from New Jersey lay one of Germany's lost U-boats, but no one knows which one. For six years, the group of divers that discovered the wreck have been trying to learn which U-boat it is. The team of divers is led by John Chatterton, a 40-year-old commercial diver who works underwater construction jobs around Manhattan, the kind that require a brass helmet and a 10,000-degree torch. By weekends, he masterminds some of the most inventive and daring shipwreck dives ever executed on the eastern seaboard. Each summer, these divers come here and search for artifacts, hoping one will identify the wreck. They do this work not for money, but for the desire to explore. After six years, they still have no answer. Every trip to the wreck takes eight hours. The divers leave at midnight to arrive at dawn. The wreck is 230 feet down. Their bodies can only tolerate two dives per day, 
and no more than 30 minutes on the bottom. Going to this depth on scuba technology is an invitation to trouble, and early on, trouble strikes. While down at the wreck, one of the divers, Steve Feldman, becomes unconscious and sinks rapidly, his mouth moving but no bubbles coming out. Five months later, a fishing boat off Atlantic City pulled a human body dressed in a diver's suit. The corpse's face had been eaten away by scavengers. The Coast Guard identified the corpse as Steve Feldman. Following Feldman's death, some of the divers on the trip that day never returned to the wreck. Others never returned to diving. There are hundreds of U-boat wrecks lying on the ocean floor. Five were sunk off the American coast, their positions recorded by the U.S. Navy. The Navy's World War II records still on file in Washington lists over 10,000 attacks on U-boats, but none at the location of the New Jersey wreck. Nor do German records mention any lost U-boat here. The identity of this boat will have to be found in the wreck itself. Shipwreck interiors can be terrifying places. Inside the wreck, where chaos is architect, dangers come camouflaged in every crevice. For many, the inside of a shipwreck is the most dangerous place they will ever go. On Columbus Day weekend 1992, the divers get another grim reminder of how unforgiving the process can be. A pair of experienced divers, Chris Rouse and his son Chris Jr., are about to search the galley. Inside the wreck, something goes terribly wrong. Chris Jr. remains trapped for 30 minutes. Then his father goes in looking for him. By now, they are both running out of air, and they cannot locate their spare tanks. As pointed out, a diver at 230 feet cannot just surface. In their panic, the father and son come up without decompressing. Their bodies are still saturated with inert gas. No longer under pressure, this gas begins bubbling out of their blood. Chatterton knows that serious decompression bends are already upon the divers. The son can no longer move his legs and is dragged onto the boat. They begin CPR on the two men, but neither survive. In a single year, the mystery U-boat has claimed three lives. Many of the divers start to wonder if the risk is simply too great. But for these divers, the quest has become an obsession. No matter what it takes, they are determined to identify this U-boat. The divers have learned that the electric motor room may hold the key. Boxes of spare parts stored here were often marked with tags bearing the U-boat's number. Having exhausted all other possibilities, the divers feel they have no choice. They will attempt the dangerous passage into the electric motor room. In the spring of 1997, John Chatterton comes up with a daring plan to get into the electric motor room to find the boxes of spare parts that may identify the U-boat. John will remove all of his tanks of gas except one. Pushing this single tank in front of him, he will squeeze his body through the narrow space of the oil tank. Once past the obstruction, he'll put his tank back on and proceed into the electric motor room. If John's plan works, he will soon enter a place unseen and untouched since the day the U-boat sank.
With his partner's help, John secures his decompression gases and removes his single tank. With only 20 minutes of gas, John swims through the hatch into the diesel room. John squeezes over the collapsed oil tank. Once past the oil tank, he's on his own. Chatterton moves swiftly into the electric motor room. The compartment remains brown and cloudy, but he can see the spare parts boxes through the silt. Chatterton moves towards the boxes, pulls the smallest one free, and stuffs it into his mesh bag. He swims out of the electric motor room. Suddenly, his head jerks back. A wire noose catches him around his neck. Being strangled and unable to move, Chatterton is now fully sewn into the wreck. He cannot move. Chatterton knows he must fight his way through the wire noose. He tears harder at the restraints. Finally, they drop away. Now free, he removes his tank and swims through the gap. After six years and three deaths, the divers have finally identified the mystery wreck, U-869. We'll never know for certain why U-869 lays at the bottom of New Jersey waters. For most of us, World War II exists only in photographs and moving pictures. Distant in time and place. But the cost of the war is still being paid today by survivors, by relatives of those who lost their lives, by those who were only children at the time, and by some who were not even born when the storm was raging. Like U-869, the scars of the Second World War are still there, hidden beneath the surface, yet closer than we realize. <laughs> 